Okay. So the next talk is going to be by Timo Longin, also known as Timo Login. He is a security consultant and a researcher. He will be talking about a new technique called SMTP smuggling for spoofing emails and exploit one of the most widely used services on the internet. Thank you. Give it up for Timo. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So, first of all, a big fat sorry for me personally and from Second Salt for this absolute dumpster fire of a vulnerability disclosure. So, specifically, sorry to Vita and Victor for having to, well, fix postfix and to all the sysadmins worldwide having to apply these fixes during Christmas holidays. And also, however, <laughs> yeah, also, however, Big thanks to Vita and Victor for their commitment and also big thanks to the community for pushing this issue, for releasing tools and so on. And for, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and for everyone that has no idea what is going on, let me catch you up to speed. So. About a year ago, I was just finish, finishing up some DNS research and I was looking for a new research target when I probably found the easiest way to hack a company. And all that just with one simple Google search. <laughs> and it might sound stupid, but this led me into the direction of something that I already knew, but I never really realized. And that is that phishing is still the number one initial access vector into a company. And then it hit me. Like, why don't I look at SMTP, the simple mail transfer protocol, which is used to send like billions of emails each day across the globe for like the past 40 years. So my journey went on from DNS to SMTP. And today I'm introducing SMTP smuggling, a novel technique for spoofing emails. Who am I? My name is Timo Longin. I work as a security consultant at Second Salt, and at day I do penetration tests, and at night I do vulnerability research. And for like the past three years, I've been looking at lots of DNS vulnerabilities, and I've published lots of blog posts and tools. And yeah, I had to move on. And the last time someone from Second Salt had a talk at the CCC, it was about dildos. And I know that I have to disappoint at least some of you, but this talk is not about penetrating the human life form. However, it is about penetrating SMTP protocol barriers. So to see how this works, well, we must first understand how sending emails in general works. So here we have a pretty simple email infrastructure. We have a mail user agent, for example, Thunderbird, and Thunderbird like, wants to send an email via user at outlook.com, for example. So now, if we want to send an email that way, we must first authenticate against the Outlook mail transfer agent or outbound SMTP server. And once we've authenticated, we're now allowed to send an email as user at outlook.com. And only as user at outlook.com. And this email then gets transferred over to the receiver inbound SMTP server, and this inbound SMTP server is now checking the email for authenticity. And the most popular way of doing this is via SPF. So the receiver inbound server is basically getting the SPF record via DNS for outlook.com, and then it sees, okay, these IP addresses and IP ranges are allowed to send emails for Outlook.com. And since, in this case, the legitimate Outlook SMTP server or outbound SMTP server sent the email, well, the inbound receiver accepts it. And now, of course, there is, well, a very interesting question. And the question is, well, is, is it possible for an attacker to send an email for example, from admin at outlook.com or from a spoofed email address. And this is what we're going to look at today, and that's more or less the goal of this research. And I don't know if you've realized, but the colors of these servers, and I cannot unsee it, but they really remind me of SpongeBob and Patrick. 
and therefore we're going to refer to them as such. So, the general goal of this research and the premise of this re research was like finding a way to spoof emails. And I was like, okay, why not take vulnerabilities from other text-based protocols like HTTP and put them into SMTP? And there was just one HTTP vulnerability that really fit the bill, and that is HTTP request smuggling. And the thing is, we again see we have SpongeBob and Patrick, but in this case, in the HTTP world. So what happens here is SpongeBob is getting a request, a post request over the internet. And the interesting thing about this post request is that it has two headers specifying how to handle the post request data. It has a content length header specifying 43 bytes, and it also has a transfer encoding header. And now SpongeBob has to decide, okay, well, how do I handle the post data now? And SpongeBob decides to use the content length. And since the content length is 43 bytes, well, all the red highlighted data is forwarded to Patrick. And Patrick is now like, okay, I have no idea what to do. So am I interpreting the content length or the transfer encoding? But now Patrick is interpreting the transfer encoding. And now we have an interpretation difference. SpongeBob uses the content length. Tra Patrick is using the transfer encoding. And since the transfer encoding specifies chunk and the first chunk is zero, well, the rest of the data that SpongeBob transferred is now interpreted as a second request which now basically means that SpongeBob sees one request and Patrick sees two requests and the second request can have like, or can target an arbitrary path, like for example, admin, which in this example is only accessible internally, which is of course a problem. And I was like, okay, why not take these interpretation differences and put them into SMTP and to understand or to get close to understanding how this works at least, we must first look at the SMTP protocol itself. So SMTP basically looks like this. We have two main components. We have in red SMTP commands, and we have in blue the message data. And to send a message now, we must first send the SMTP commands. So we must first introduce ourselves. We must specify a sender address, one or more recipient addresses, and then we send a data command to tell the receiving SMTP server to essentially, yeah, now receive the message data. And then we send message data, we specify a from address again, we specify a to address, we specify a subject, and then comes the message body. And at some point, when we now want to stop transferring the message data, we must send something that is called an end of data sequence, which is a carriage return line feed dot carriage return line feed. And now it was like, well, maybe we can use that to somehow confuse SMTP server implementations. And the idea was basically that we have SpongeBob again, and we submit an email to SpongeBob. And this email contains something very weird. It is something that looks like an end of data sequence, but it's not an end of data sequence. Because it's not RFC conform, but like someone could mistake it for an end of data sequence. So SpongeBob looks at this and is like, okay, this is not the thing from the RFC. I'm not gonna interpret this as an end of data sequence. So the, the next or the message data that follows to this is still like message data until the actual end of data sequence comes. And now SpongeBob sends this over to Patrick. And now Patrick is like, oh, yeah, I don't really care about RFCs. So what I do is, well, I interpret this fake end of data sequence as an actual end of data sequence. And the problem here is that everything following this end of data sequence is now interpreted as SMTP commands. And what we can do now as an attacker is we can specify SMTP commands that send another email. So even though SpongeBob only saw one big email, Patrick is now seeing two smaller emails. And the problem is that the second email can have like arbitrary SMTP commands, meaning it could come from admin at outlook.com or whatever. So yeah, that's the theory at least. And to see if this really works, 
I first of all checked out some SMTP server implementations by simply connecting to some servers via Telnet or via Netcat. And when I did that and I sent the data command, first of all, it looked like very RFC conform. So basically, when you send the data command, the server asks you to stop this data stream via carriage return line feed dot carriage return line feed. But then I also found some servers that just say, well, just send me a dot on a line by itself. And the thing with this dot on a line by itself is that it's very much dependent on the operating system that you're on. Meaning on Windows, this could be a carriage return line feed dot carriage return line feed. On Linux, this could be a line feed dot line feed. And at that point, I, I thought I was onto something, so I checked something out. And the first thing I tried is like using these kinds of line feeds, carriage returns, dots, and trying to like stuff them through SpongeBob. So I wrote an SMTP analysis client, which basically sends emails containing fake end of data sequences, for example, line feed dot line feed, and I sent them through various kinds of SMTP software. This includes email services like Gmail, like Outlook, like GMX, but also email software like Sendmail, like Postfix, XM, Microsoft uh, Exchange Server, and so on. And now on the inbound side, on the inbound receiver side, I checked which fake sequences actually go through. So can I send a line feed dot line feed through an outbound server? And in most cases, it doesn't work. Like a line feed dot line feed very often just gets filtered or removed from the initial email. But in some cases, it just goes through without a change. And this was the case for GMX. So basically, I send an email from GMX to my analysis server, and the line feed dot carriage return line feed sequence did not get filtered whatsoever. So now what I did is I created a proof of concept here where, first of all, we send an email, then we have this fake end of data sequence, and then we have SMTP commands and data for a second email. So now if this proof of concept works, we should receive two emails on our receiver end. And I sent all of this to Gmail. And Gmail was like, yeah, this is not an end of data sequence. And you can see that because everything after this end of data sequence is still interpreted as message data. But in some cases, it actually works. And this was the first case of successful SMTP smuggling. So from GMX to Fastmail. And we can see that it works because, well, we have two emails. We have, first of all, user at gmx.net, and secondly, an email from admin at gmx.net that passes SPF and DMARC checks as well, because it comes from the actual server from GMX. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is super sick. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking, so we have this second email and everything can be in there. Like the sender address can be anything, so why not try other domains that point to the server of GMX. And then I analyzed the SPF record and I realized, well, there we have the GMX SPF record, but this is very similar to the WebDE SPF record, which is also very similar to the one of Jonas. And the thing is that we can now spoof like 1.35 million domains with this. So if you don't know Yonos, they're like a super big hosting provider and they also provide emailing services and yeah, they have like all these 1.35 million domains pointing here. So yeah, I had, of course had to try this, so here's an email from admin at WebDE. And now of course there's a question of does this work everywhere? Because as I said, this only works with servers that interpret, well, non-RFC conform end of data sequences, like line feed dot carriage return line feed. So we can smuggle or spoof these 1.35 million domains to, well, some servers. So essentially we have 1.4 million postfix instances and like 150k send mail instances and this works well because they interpret carriage uh, they interpret line feed dot carriage return line feed confusing myself here as end of data sequence. And I was like okay 
this is pretty severe, but there is more. So I looked at Outlook.com as well, and Outlook gave me a very weird uh, error message because they were like, bare line feeds are illegal. And I was like, oh damn, they, they know what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore I analyzed it. Like, okay, you're not gonna scare me with that one. So then I found out, well, line feed dot carriage return line feed is also possible here. <laughs> Yeah, so let's have some fun. <laughs> the thing is, however, at that point, I wasn't really sure if I'm going insane or if this actually works. So I needed some kind of sanity check. And therefore, I sent an email from admin at outlook.com to some coworkers. And the idea behind this is, if they react to this, it works. Otherwise, I'm insane. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Maybe now for a more international example, because this is very Austrian, I guess. I don't know. So, yeah. <laughs> I guess you also understand this if you don't speak German. <laughs> and now you might be like, okay, we can send text-based spoofed emails, but you're not gonna, like, fool anyone with this. But the thing is, like, we can smuggle basically anything, HTML included. So here I send an email, a phishing email, in an unusual sign-in activity email from no reply at outlook.com from the actual outlook.com servers to myself, and it just went through. Yeah, but again, what's, what's possible with this? And I was wondering, so we can spoof outlook.com, but what else can we do with this? So I looked at the SPF record, and it was, well, weird in terms of weirdly familiar, because this is not only the SPF record of Outlook.com, but also the SPF record of, like, millions of other domains. Because this is actually, like, the SPF record from Exchange Online. Because Outlook.com sends its emails, well, across the Exchange Online infrastructure, so, yeah. Now we can basically spoof them all. So I again had to test this one. <laughs> but the thing is here, this only worked on a technical level, so I didn't get the race. So what's the impact? Essentially, we can spoof from millions of domains, but who accepts these emails? Again, postfix and send mail. However, only postfix and send mail instances they do not support the BDAT command. And the BDAT command is like an alternative to the data command, and if that is supported, it doesn't work. So that was outbound SMTP smuggling. So that is like one part of it, but then there is also inbound SMTP smuggling. And with outbound SMTP smuggling, the issue was basically at the outbound server because the outbound server basically failed to filter or insufficiently filtered like fake end of data sequences like line feed dot carriage return line feed. So now with Microsoft and GMX. And then there's also inbound SMTP smuggling. And this happens when there's just an inbound server that interprets such a wild end of data sequence that the outbound server would never even get the idea of filtering that. And I found exactly that with Cisco Secure, of course, email <laughs> cloud gateway. <laughs> So, because what they do is they clean the message and every bare line feed and every bare carriage return character now gets replaced with a carriage return line feed. So, essentially, a carriage return dot carriage return gets interpreted as end of data sequence. <laughs> A 
And the issue, of course, is now that this carriage return, that carriage return does not get filtered at all, basically. So there are, of course, some services that filter this, but we have, again, Exchange Online, iCloud, SendMail, PostFix, and so many others that just let this through. And I guess it kind of makes sense to let this through because I wouldn't get the idea of filtering that either. So I had to test this out again. And unfortunately, or well, it technically it worked again, but I did not receive any Apple devices. Not that I wanted that anyways, but yeah. What's the impact here? So essentially, we can spoof from even more domains as before, like we have Exchange Online, we have iCloud, we have all PostFix and SendMail. And we can spoof two companies that can actually afford this stuff. So like pretty big companies here. This also includes like 40 other, uh, 40K other domains, and that's only the ones that are hosted in the cloud. So they're also on-prem, but I wasn't able to enumerate them. Yeah, and now to the part that's probably interesting to you, or to the most at least, so the responsible disclosure. So essentially, on a purely technical level regarding inbound and outbound servers, who's at fault here? So essentially, we have inbound servers that are never supposed or not supposed to interpret anything else as an end of data sequence than a carriage return line feed dot carriage return line feed, at least by the RFC. And then there are outbound SMTP servers that are not supposed to send carriage returns and line feeds independent of each other. So yeah, basically everyone's at fault. So we sent that to GMX, and they were like super thankful, and they were like, okay, we're gonna fix this right away. 10 days later, they fixed this. They said, okay, can we recheck this? We recheck this, they actually fixed this. They paid us a small bounty. They even put us in their back bounty hall of fame, and all, all in all, like, that was a 10 out of 10 experience. I'm going to send them this clip of you clapping. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, it really felt like we should have paid them the back bounty because, yeah. But the thing is, from here, it just goes downhill. So we have Microsoft. And Microsoft was like, yeah, this is like a moderate risk vulnerability because, I don't know, I guess they have bigger fish to fry. But yeah, anyways. <laughs> so. We sent it to them, and like three months later, they closed the case and said, yeah, all right, it's fixed, no bounty whatsoever, so okay. But the thing is, at that point, well, I already got what I wanted, and that's an email from admin at Microsoft.com. <laughs> and now to Cisco. Well, Cisco was like, okay, this is not a vulnerability. This is a documented and configurable feature. <laughs> And we were like, okay, that's a weird feature because, like, <laughs> we can spoof some emails with that. So, yeah, we said, okay, at least, like, tell your customers about this feature that it's maybe not the best default feature, but, yeah, anyways. Yeah, they said no. <laughs> yeah. So then we were like, okay, we got this whole big SMTP smuggling issue. Cisco doesn't want to fix anything. Microsoft at that point was vulnerable. And we take this case to CertCC. And CertCC, for all of you that don't know that, is the Cert Coordination Center. And they basically handle all these big vulnerabilities. So that could have a worldwide impact. And we sent this to them. And they actually accepted the case. And now you're like in this Vince portal, this, which is basically a big glorified chat room with 14 vendors. We have like SendMail, Microsoft, Cisco, uh, Google in there. And yeah, so now you can start talking about the vulnerability. And the first conversation was basically with Cisco still saying that they're not vulnerable. You know, yeah, it's not a bug, it's a feature. And yeah, essentially they were still like, it's not a vulnerability. And then Cis, uh, CertCC was like, yeah, this is not a vulnerability for some reason. Okay, so what about the general SMTP smuggling problem? 
So what about postfix and send mail interpreting non-RFC conform end of data sequences? So first of all, send mail was in this Vince portal to begin with. So from the start, they got all the PUCs, all the messages, all yeah, everything, and they were like, they didn't say anything. And then what about postfix? Because they're ten times larger. Essentially, Cert CC was like, first of all, I don't know why they didn't add them to the case directly, but they sent them an email or contacted them via email, but forgot to mention SMTP smuggling. So now we're here thinking that they told, po so we, we thought that they told postfix, sent mail apparently didn't care. Search CC sides with Cisco regarding this feature. So now we're like, okay, Cisco, uh, Cisco, yeah, is definitely vulnerable. We've confirmed that. So we would like to publish this in a blog post. And that's where all the problem starts. So we said, okay, we would like to publish this in a blog post. And we would warn Cisco customers about the feature. And Search CC is like, go ahead. So just. <laughs> send us the link to the blog post once this is published. And we were like, yeah, we go ahead with that. And now, basically, we open Pandora's box. Because now, 1.6 million post, make, uh, post fix and send mail instances on the internet are vulnerable. Meaning, now, if there is another case of outbound SMTP smuggling, you can smuggle to post fix and send mail still. Does that mean Second Salt is not at fault at all? Of course, Second Salt is at fault, because we published this blog post thinking the, the impact of all of this is way lower than it actually is, based on our great conversation with CertCC and Vince in general. And also, if we would have just double-checked that with PostFix, this, this is really not an issue, none of this would have happened, because PostFix is very adamant about the fact that this is actually an issue. So yeah. In conclusion, what does this mean? Please fix your PostFix service. You can find more information about that on the PostFix website. Also, please fix your Cisco service. You can find more information about that on the Second Salt blog post. In the end, however, there is some kind of sil silver lining, at least, because now PostFix is directly in the Vince case, and they've already made some great contributions. So we're not putting our head in the sand, and we're actively somehow trying to close Pandora's box again. And what does that mean? Essentially, more research on like SMTP smuggling. I mean, I asked search to before to like, look at this more, but yeah, this didn't really end well. And more blog posts, more research, first, first and foremost, um, more vendors in the Vince case. So we're trying to get everything fixed right now. And again, we are very sorry that this happened in the first place. And finally, something that probably all of you know anyways, do not trust emails blindly, especially not now. Thank you. Nice, thank you. Let's go with the Q&A. Um, please, go ahead. Hello, I have one small question. The CERT CC stuff, was this communicated via email? And could you not have sent the mail at the Cisco CTO? Um, yeah, I mean, we could have done that and created some kind of love triangle between Bill Gates, Elon Musk, and <laughs> someone else, I guess. but. Yeah, no, we didn't see this email, unfortunately. Like, we saw it after that, yeah, but then it was kind of too late, unfortunately. Uh, hi, thank you, uh, appreciate the work. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about the timeline? Like, when did you first discover this? Like, so how fresh? This was first discovered, so I started the research in June this year. So basically, we, I had a research project at Second Salt for like 10 days. And I was like, OK, these 10 days, they're not going to be enough. So I started 10 days earlier. And then I like found 
SMTP smuggling on day six. And yeah, then it just goes on from telling this GMX, Outlook, or Microsoft, and Cisco, because they had these severe cases of SMTP smuggling, meaning outbound and inbound. And then we went ahead and told this to CERTC, because there seems to be a general issue with SMTP smuggling worldwide. And timeline-wise, I don't have it here right now, but it is in the second cell blog post. And yeah, but is, is there a specific date that you want to know? No, no, just I'll check the blog post. Thanks. One. Hello. Um, thank you for the good talk here. Um, I wanted to ask, is there any evidence or any suggestions that this has been used already? Um, because this seems like a, well, pretty easy exploit to use, so I might imagine it has been used already. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I received some comments on my Reddit post, and it was like, yeah, this is super old. But thing is... <laughs> Medium severity. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I don't know, really. I, I looked at lots of research, but nothing really said otherwise. So that's why I called it the novel vulnerability. So I don't know. 